So we continue in uh, the Gospel of Mark. We're at the 10th chapter. It may sound familiar to you. I know it was to me. Um, so what we have is Jesus walking along the way, encountering people, and it being recorded. And so, again, I always think we have such a small portion of what actually happened. And, and I think that the Gospel writer wanted to be representative of those who ask questions. So my guess is this is not the only person who ever asked Jesus um, what to do to inherit eternal life, but it's the one that's recorded. Also, I just wanted to give you a heads up because this is the passage that has, um, it's easier for the camel to pass through the eye of a needle. So one of the things that, uh, gospel, that um, biblical historians say is that one of the gates into Jerusalem that was a particularly small gate, you know, think like my size, well, my height anyway. So <laughs> it was a smaller gate so only human beings could pass through so that, um, so that they didn't have traffic of incoming goods. Again, think of the front entrance of a restaurant rather than the storage, you know, the livery entrance. So that gate in Jerusalem was also called the eye of the needle because it was so small. So again, what it, that helped me anyway, because I was like, what are they talking about? How many needles did they have? So just know that one of those gates that was particularly small, like me small, um, was called the eye of the needle. So anyway, here we go. So it says that as Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked teacher, and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one's good but God alone. You know the commandments. Thou shalt not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. And you shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come and follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked, and he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. And then Jesus looked around and he said to his disciples, How hard is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were perplexed at these words, but then Jesus said again, Children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded, and they said to one another, Then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. And Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything to follow you. And Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left his house, his brothers or his sisters, his mother or father, and children and fields, for my sake, or for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold in this age. The brothers, houses, sisters, mothers, fathers, the fields and with persecution, and the age of eternal life to come. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. There ends the reading. May God add a blessing. So I imagine this rich man running up to Jesus because he wants to get a check mark next to his name. <laughs> My guess is this guy fully anticipated Jesus going, yeah, you're great, you're good. Because I know that oftentimes I don't talk to people unless I'm pretty sure that they're going to agree with me and you know talk nice to me I don't want anybody kind of throwing a wrench in the works and he is a good Jewish man and so he knows all of the rules not only that he is a wealthy man now one of the beliefs of uh, general religious folk you know just kind of popular <laughs> think of popular science this is popular religion is that if you're wealthy, then God is blessing you, and so you must be doing something good. That if you're wealthy, then God certainly is pleased with you because you're getting all kinds of blessings. And that if you're poor, then that's your own fault. 
Just know that this whole contention continues throughout the centuries. I'm hoping that we've gotten rid of it pretty much, but still, people who are wealthy will think, well, you know, that's just what I get. And people who are poor go, well, I must not have done something right and God doesn't love me. So this wealthy man who was coming up to Jesus and has been, I'm sure, a faithful Jew all of his life. He was probably raised by good Jewish parents. He figures he's good, he's in, he's great. And so he says, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Because his assumption is, at least I think, that he has, he's done. That eternal life, that life with God. And so for me, eternal life, and I, again, for me, this is what Jesus is saying. It's not just about what happens after our death, but what happens during our life. The sense of eternal being present with us in each moment. Anyway, that's me. Um, so the guy is like, I'm good to get I'll talk to the latest moral teacher who's around. He's getting lots of cred out there. You know, he's, he's definitely top of the charts. And uh, he figures he's good. And one of my favorite lines in this text, although the whole, you know, anything is possible if God is good too. But one of my favorite lines is Jesus looking at him and loving him. For me, that's always a sense of who God is. That God looks into our hearts, looks into our souls, looks into who we are, and loves us. Loves us more fiercely than we can even imagine. Loves us tenderly and completely as any of us loves a child. Loves us. And as he loves this man, he sees the thing that holds him captive. And what holds him captive is his stuff, his wealth. He's protected by all of that. And so Jesus says to him, okay, you're doing good. One more thing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it won't be a problem. No, he doesn't say that. He says, one more thing. Give everything that you have. Sell all your possessions and follow me. And of course he has not only the 12 disciples, but apparently there's record of about 70 people also who follow him who follow. So this isn't unusual. And he's just, that's, that's beyond his imagining, to let go of his stuff. But if I said to any of you, sure, God loves you. So what she's asking is, you sell your house today. The market's great. <laughs> you sell your house, you give it all to the poor, and then you go on mission. Nobody's going to go, yeah, Mary, that sounds like a great plan. Let's all do it together. <laughs> and for me, that's okay. For me, the point is that Jesus is trying to point to the thing that holds him in front of, not holds him, but holds him away from God's complete love. That that love cannot break through the barrier of his security that he's created with his wealth and with his possessions. And I think in many ways, our culture is there most of the time, that we had our lives with all of our stuff. And that oftentimes it's hard for us to sense God's love for us, see the provision of his blessings for us, see all that God is doing for us each day because our wealth protects us and our love ends up being diluted into a thousand things. Here's the story. <laughs> I always feel like I'm going, where am I going? The thing is, is that you guys are here, and so you're my choir, you know? You're the ones who have made it here this morning, and that took prioritizing getting here. That just didn't happen, because that bed is awfully soft, particularly at eight o'clock in the morning, particularly when you don't have to work that day, and y'all made it here. And I know that, you know, again, during the time that I was raising boys, there was a family who my uh, boys used to hang out with, and they were all about soccer. They were all about soccer. And so one afternoon, I, had, um, I was watching a game that both of our boys were playing in, and I was standing next to the woman, and she says, yeah, I haven't made it to church, really, gosh, you know, since August. And, of course, it's getting close to November now. You know, soccer. Well, I've been here at the soccer field. I'm afraid to say my response is, well, we always go to our sanctuaries to worship. <laughs> because what she wanted me to say was, of course, you know, I understand. But what I felt like saying was, you know, there's other leagues that you can be in that don't do Sunday morning. 
But for her, that was the trade. And again, it sounds very judgmenty. I don't mean to be judgmenty, but we do, we trade all kinds of things. And I always believe it's very easier for me to see the speck in somebody else's eye than my log. But I do know that for me, being at church on Sunday morning is life-giving. It's the place where I get things back in balance. I think that's what Jesus is trying to say to this man, is all the stuff can skew you out of balance until you think the purpose of your life is that stuff or that wealth or whatever it is, those kids, that job, that car, more than God, more than God who loves us, more than God who brings us life, more than God who brings us eternal life. So for me, this um, passage is not about how we're going to get to heaven because I think, again, all of that's God's deal and that forgiveness and that salvation is through that relationship with God, with Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ. But that it's how do we live this life? How do we live the eternal presence in this moment? How do we find the strength that God wants to give us? How do we live the life that Paul is talking about with kind talk, caring, loving, doing that life of grace. And I go back to that first command, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. For me, that's the place to find life, to find life passionately in that relationship with God. And then in that relationship with God, talk to God about what might be keeping you from God. Talk to God about things that might be making barriers for you before fully loving and surrendering to all that God has for you. Have that passion. So here, only one more story. Because I come up thinking, you know, I've always wondered how to kind of tell you about this passion that I think about. And for me, I have to go back to ninth grade. We're just talking about ninth grade homecoming. And ninth grade homecoming was my first big, huge crush on a boy. I don't know if you remember those days. <laughs> Mine was called Chris, and I don't say his last name anymore because of another story, but anyway, somebody actually knew him, so. <laughs> but his name was Chris, and he was the cutest. He had the most beautiful voice ever known to humankind. Actually, he's gone on to be an opera singer. Anyway, so I crush, total crushing. And so, of course, I found out exactly what his schedule was. I knew where his locker was. I knew when he went to his locker. I, at the football games, would place myself discreetly next to him just in case there was a touchdown. Yay! <laughs> of course, all of that made no difference, but <laughs> I was, as a ninth grade girl is, just obsessed with this boy. And when I think about how God loves us to want us passionately, I don't think of it in a negative way in terms of just being wild and crazy, but that kind of passion that kind of love, that kind of focus, where we're like, Lord, I know you're here with me. Can I pay attention more? Here you are again, showing me a blessing. Here I am in one more really hard time. Help me to be patient and find you. And I believe that God wants us for that, that passionate love for us, us to return that love so that we can find life. And what Jesus talks about is eternal life. So that that young man who came to him and said, I've been doing everything right, absolutely everything that the church has told me to do. Of course, for them, it's called synagogue and a religious institution. And Jesus said, yeah, you have. And I think almost, again, what I interpret him to say is that externally you have been. And your heart is still over here in your stuff rather than with God. But mixed up in all of this, this story about how do we find eternal life, the story about what God is doing for us, the story about how do we live life, Jesus says, yeah, it's hard for somebody to get through that opening with all their stuff, but we're not looking to human beings to do it. For with God, all things are possible. And so this morning, I think again, where do we put our trust in our stuff 
in our retirement. I have, again, I have a good amount of trust in making sure that my retirement's in a good place <laughs> and making sure that I can work. All of that, I need to be able to pay for my life. But the ground of my being, my trust in being able to make it from one day to the next as a sane person in this world, that's fully relying on God. Knowing the phrases that I can come back to God when life is hard. Yesterday, I, I said I wouldn't do one more story. Sorry about this. I, yesterday, I tried to give blood. All right. They went in both arms. Oh. <laughs> Never got any blood. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole time, this hour and a half, I'm like, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. <laughs> Again, that to me is what the gift of this passage is about. When life isn't great, God is there wanting to hold you up. When life is wonderful, we understand the source of the blessing and know how to find the strength in it. Jesus is telling this man not to get rid of his stuff because he thinks that's the way we should all live, which I think we could probably all live simpler. But anyway, not to do that. But because this stuff is what's holding him from a relationship with God. And it's one of the things that I love about the season of Lent. Because in the season of Lent, we are asked more intentionally to examine what might be coming between us and God. But I think that's a year-long process. For me, it's pretty much a daily process. So as people of God, as people who are called to be Christ's disciples, as people who know that with God all things are possible, then we too can find that passion, that ninth grade crush kind of passion about seeking God in each moment of our life, of finding the joy that God has waiting for us. Because again, not only that we can worship God, which is a good thing, but that we can find the fullness of life and joy in every moment that we can be those people who beckon others to a life of forgiveness, healing, and wholeness found within the love of God who loves us so much. Amen.